Great, good morning everyone, thank you Penny. Um, I'm very deliberately called it a history um, of the <laughs> introduction in Scotland, so I don't think I'm really qualified to give you the history. Um, and I'm sure many in the room can have further details to what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, it's, it's very much the part of the day where we're just doing a little bit of reflection, I guess, before we look forward. Um, and the, the rest of the talks in the day are going to look to future pieces in Scotland and very much where we're going from here. So, I will start in 1995 and take you all the way through to present today, trying to highlight some of the key events that have happened during that time period. Um, and as I say, I don't have the gaps, but forgive me for those. So, back in 1995, um, SNH began to investigate, investigate the feasibility and desirability of beavers returning to Scotland. Now, some of this was prompted very much by the European Commission Habitats Directive, which requires EU member states to study the desirability of reintroducing species such as beaver when they become extinct. So I think that definitely prompted some of the research that began in 1995. Um, the initial application that then followed in 2005 was turned down, for, um, or support was turned down by the Scottish Government uh, because officials um, what well, support from the government officials couldn't be secured for undertaking the trial, which was planned for the Napdale area. Um, the media, media commentary at the time suggested that the reason for the application being rejected was the potential impacts on the Natura features of the host site um, and the exit strategy for the trial, which was ba basically um, involved with lethal control. So, at, at that point, which I'm sure it was a great disappointment for SNH at the time, uh, the Scottish Wildlife Trust became much more involved and active behind the scenes with ministers, working hard to advocate for the case to undertake a trial and to think about um, performing a trial again in the Napdale area. In addition to this, uh, a partnership was formed between the Trust and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, which definitely began to build the case and, and add impetus to trying to put forward an application or a successful application for um, a trial and reintroduction of beavers to Scotland. So that licence did get submitted, um, but the key change between... Yeah. Oh, this one, yeah. That's right. Is that a bit better? Come on, mate. Um, Okay, so a key change between 2005, uh, the application then, and 2008 was that the new partnership between the Trust and RWSS allowed SNH to have independent monitoring and advisor role to the ministers. Um, so the trial built upon the um, 98 and 2000 consultations that SNH had undertaken, the public consultation uh, was also undertaken in 2007 ahead of an application going in. Um, and a separate stakeholder forum was established prior to the first beaver release uh, over in Napdale to, to allow those stakeholder views to be fed into the decision making process. So, you know, it was a huge, huge effort to engage um, and definitely the independent monitoring aspect or the independence SNH would have on the trial and its undertakings that I think helped uh, in. Scottish Beaver Trial being approved or being awarded a licence. This of course was also very um, much because the Scottish National Party and the Green Party at the time appeared to share the vision that it was the right to see something involved for Scotland um, and award a licence to undertake a trial over in that day. So the then Environment Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham, uh, approved the licence and was involved in releasing the first beavers to Mapdale, which happened in 2009. Uh, the Trust and the RZSS single underway with the beaver trial, and it was one of the largest trials of its kind in Europe. Uh, and the purpose was definitely to help the Scottish Government make an informed decision about the future of the species in Scotland. 
So the trial objectives were set out in the original license application to study the ecology and biology of the Eurasian beaver in Scotland, assess the effects of beaver activities on the natural and socio-economic situations, generate uh, information and inform potential further releases of beavers at other sites, and determine the extent and impact of the any increased tourism generated through the presence of beavers and explore the environmental education opportunities that might arise from the trial and beyond. A large body of research was coordinated by SNH during the trial period um, and it covered many things from beaver ecology, fish ecology, dragonflies, damselflies, woodlands, uh, the list went on. And, um, Definitely during the five year period of the trial, um, a huge effort was made by a great number of people to monitor and assess. And uh, rather rewardingly, a huge effort was made by the beavers to create an impact on the environment they've been introduced to over in Napdale. And this is some of the footage that was taken to show um, one of the flooded woodlands that they created during their time over in Napdale. The trial did give an opportunity to undertake a huge amount of engagement um, and as you can see from the numbers there, it was an impressive amount of engagement that was undertaken during the five years. So running alongside the Scottish Beaver trial, the story was unfolding on the Tayside catchment um, and it's thought that these animals escaped as early as 2006, possibly even before that. Um, and the Tayside catchment of course is much larger than that down with extensive low-lying farm low-lying areas and farmland um, and the potential for conflict in this area was, was greatly increased. So in March 2012, uh, a request of the then Environment Secretary, um, Stuart Stevenson, I think, uh, the Tayside Beaver Study Group was set up to gather information and monitor the beavers um, and monitor impacts on land use and find out more about how to manage them. So between 2012 and 2017, um, surveys were commissioned by SNH, and that showed that beaver territories increased over that time from approximately 40 to 114, and the total population also increased from around 150 beavers to 433. Um, the report also highlighted that beavers were naturally dispersing into other catchments, but worryingly, uh, the report also highlighted areas where beavers were once present in Tayside but had disappeared. Um, and those conducting the survey indicated the evidence pointed to those gaps being mainly due to culls carried out by land managers. So despite various proactive attempts and steps being made, the tensions definitely were building on Tayside um, and beavers are being shot. So concerns were raised and SMH issued an interim, manage interim management guidance in 2017 that strongly discouraged lethal control as a solution and advised practical mitigation as a, um, a more successful approach and also provided advice on human dispatch. So winding back from 2017 slightly, back in 2015 um, the evidence was drawn together from the trial and from the European studies um, and SNH put together um, its assessment on beaver interactions with humans and natural environment, legal issues, management considerations, all of this was drawn together in a document that was given to the Scottish Ministers and published in 2015. Um, on the slide of the four future scenarios which were presented to the Scottish Government in that document um, as suggested ways forward to consider. Now the advice from SNH was that beavers overall have a very positive impact on the environment, wetland habitats and wildlife, but also bring social economic benefits. But some impacts would need to be managed in relation to people, infrastructure and farming. Now despite all this evidence, the Tayside situation seems to be preventing the Scottish Minister um, from taking a decision on the long-term future of beavers in Scotland. So uh, the National Farmers Union and the Scottish Land and Estates were lobbying hard that beavers should be removed from the Tay catchment due to their impacts. However, the numbers um, in the catchment are quite significant. So the Cabinet Secretary of the Environment, Climate Change and Landfall, Rosanna Cunningham, 
um, held a fact-finding visit to Tayside with the um, National Farmers Union of Scotland, the Scottish Land and Estates, the Scottish Wildlife Trust, and the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And from that meeting came a commitment uh, from the four bodies to work together to create a joint agreement on the future management of beavers. So this was based on the principle of learning to live with beavers as an opening standpoint um, and supports a hierarchy of management to initially tolerate, go down the road of habitat modifications, track and relocate, and lethal control is a last resort where significant socio-economic impacts, especially to climate and cultural land, will be experienced. So, um, it's very much believed, and I think the Cabinet Secretary has almost stated that that agreement um, and letter to her triggered the announcement of um, formal steps being taken by Scottish Government to progress things such as the Habitat Regulation Assessment and the Strategic Environment Assessment um, to inform or to underpin the statutory instrument to allow beavers to have legal status and legal protection here in Scotland. So the process seemed to take a rather a long time um, and a further two years uh, beavers were being killed without checks and balances in place. So towards the end of 2018 the Trust decided to increase pressure on the political process by sending an open letter to First Minister Nicola Sturgeon calling for a firm commitment to grant beavers a protected status in Scotland and in parallel to that or in addition to that um, interest was growing down south um, and the charity Client Earth, which employs lawyers with expertise in protecting nature and the environment, sent a letter to the First Minister reminding the Scottish Government of their legal responsibility, responsibilities for beavers under the EU Habitats Directive. So once the decision had been um, made, or the Ministers um, that stated that beavers could remain in Scotland, uh, Arzad Assess and the Scottish Wildlife Trust again came together and looked at putting together a licence to reinforce Napdale uh, or the beavers over in Napdale. Um, and on the back of the ministerial announcement, we were given a licence to undertake that work over three years with, with the aim of uh, reinforcing the numbers over in Napdale to help contribute to the establishment and expansion of that population. The new phase of work started in September 2017 and we were given a license for 28 additional beavers to be released over a three year period. The source of some of these beavers is Tayside um, as a means of mitigation, mitigating some of the pressures in the area whilst management trials continue. So we've continued the, the approach of, of consulting nationally and locally um, and national stakeholders were either positive or neutral about the work but local stakeholders we were very pleased to learn were largely positive and many local tourism businesses and breakfast wildlife operators acknowledged the positive impact that beavers had had on um, their business in that day. So the licence itself runs through until October 2020 um, and we are continuing that work just now. Very happily, in 2019, beavers were finally granted um, official protected status um, and the quote on there is from Rosanna Cunningham, which I think we welcomed along with many other people um, that she recognised the values beavers would bring to the Scottish environment. And um, in addition, we were very happy that the Species Champion uh, scheme could finally have a champion for the beavers in Scotland, something we've all been thinking about for quite some time, but of course until, official, um, until all the official legalities are in place, it wasn't really an option. Um, but it's been a very welcome addition to the LINK programme. And of course, I think all of us in the room are very happy that they finally reached European protected status here in Scotland. So I haven't attempted in any way to list all the thank yous that I should put on this slide for fear of missing people out. Um, but I did want to mention very much Jill Douse, who's here in the audience, my colleague at the Trust, and my predecessor Susan Davis, 
you've definitely made the compilation of this 